citizenship here at Drake University. As an international company, our leaders at the principal recognize the importance of global awareness and understanding, and they strive to create opportunities for our employees and members here at Drake University and in the community to learn more about these. Though we are headquartered here in Des Moines, downtown, we have pension and asset management operations all over the world, including but not limited to Europe, Asia, South America, and the Middle East. Principal is not the exception, though, when it comes to doing business across cultures. As more and more companies look to do business outside of the United States, panel discussions like this evening's become more and more important. A big thank you to Drake University for hosting the event this evening and for offering your students, employees at the principal, and for members of the community to broaden our horizons. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Skidmore, who will be introducing our group of esteemed panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. My, that's, that's pretty loud. Uh, <laughs> is there any way to turn this down or I can whisper? Um, wow, what a turnout. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I am David Skidmore. I'm director of the Principal Financial Group Center for Global Citizenship and a professor of political science here at Drake. And uh, uh, I want to begin certainly by thanking the Principal Financial Group uh, on so many levels. Uh, the principal has uh, provided generous funding to support the Center for Global Citizenship. Uh, they have, have partnered with us in a, in, in a number of different activities through the center, including, I believe, that this is the sixth panel of this sort that we've uh, co-sponsored with uh, Principal Financial Group. And really, Principal Financial Group is so intertwined with Drake uh, across the board in multiple ways that it really helps enrich the education of our, our students, and we much appreciate it. I also want to thank uh, Mark Chazak, who is, uh, 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 has been a great partner in working with myself and others in uh, organizing all these panels today. Um, so the, I really love the panel format because it gives us an opportunity to be spontaneous, uh, to have a conversational style event, um, and uh, it's a bit more personal, I think. Um, so that tonight what we're going to do is, is I'll introduce the panelists, then we'll walk through some questions that we scripted out ahead of time, and then we'll turn it over to the audience to let you guys ask questions of of the panelists, and we'll wrap up uh, uh, certainly before 8.30 tonight. So let me go ahead and, and begin by introducing our panelists. We really have an all-star uh, group tonight. Uh, just to my left is uh, Professor Matt Mitchell uh, of International Business and Strategy in the Business College here at, at, at Drake University. Um, next to Matt is Claudia Chapel, who is a Brazil native and most importantly, a Drake graduate. Uh, she is a diversity consultant with DuPont Pioneer. And then uh, next to Claudia is Barb McKenzie. She is Senior Executive Director, COO and, and Boutique Operations at Principal Global Investors. Um, uh, next we have Brene Schaff, who is Vice President strategic planning and business development for Principal International. And then uh, on the far end is Professor Jeffrey Kaplan uh, of the uh, of International Business here at the Business School at, at Drake University. So um, let's begin uh, with, a, with a question about something very concrete. Um, and I'm going to ask each of the panelists to tell us about their most challenging case in working across cultures, a specific ex example. Um, and anyone can, can jump in as you see fit. I'll get started. Why not, right? Yes. It's a pleasure to be here. And I remember taking a business course in this room. It feels good to be on this end of the room, though. It was a math of some sort. Not my forte. My forte might be telling a story. So I'll, I'll be telling a story about how I started learning about different cultures 
and how that actually applied to the business environment. It started when I was very young, when I was 17 years old. One might be thinking, were you an expat? No, I was not. I was um, moving from Brazil, where I was born, to Japan to work in a factory. Long story short, my parents decided to move from Brazil to Japan and the alternative versus going to school was let's make a living and go back to Brazil. So I very eagerly and very excited about the opportunity to work and, and learn about a different culture, I packed my bags with my parents and moved to Japan to learn very early on that just having an open mind about a different culture is just the first step. Just wanting to be in a different country and learn from different backgrounds, it's just the journey, the journey is just starting. So when I moved to Japan, I didn't speak the language, I don't look Japanese. So in the circumstances, there are multiple factors that make people either lean towards opening their minds and having an open attitude towards you or not. The circumstances for us were not very favorable. There were a lot of misconceived, misconceived notions, misperceptions, assumptions made on both ends. My assumptions about Japanese culture and assumptions about uh, Brazilians in Japan. So uh, I learned early on that uh, just having an open mind is not enough. You really need to, to learn to engage people and learn firsthand who they are without the stereotypes and some of your preconceived notions. So that was the beginning for me in learning more about different cultures and how that applied in the, in the work environment. Now the tie with the work environment is that when you have a diverse workforce, when you have immigrants working in a company with uh, natives from Japan or the United States, it's important that you include all of your employees. And it's important that you convey to them, top down and bottom up, that inclusion is the way that we do business, is a way of doing business. And unfortunately, that was not my experience in Japan. So I learned uh, from, from that experience what to do right versus what to model, model wrong. I'll go next. So I was going to talk about Japan, but I'm going to change it up now. <laughs> <laughs> and give you a, um, an example from Australia instead. So um, I went down to um, Sydney. We bought a, a big company in Sydney in 99, and I moved down there in early 2000. And um, I'd been down, I'd probably spent a couple of months on the ground before I moved, and, and um, as an American going to Sydney, you think, oh, this is really going to be easy, it's very familiar, it's very American, and or British. And a couple of years later, there was nothing British and certainly nothing American about that culture. Um, but, it, you know, that's, that was one lesson that I, that, um, I learned really early on where when you go to Japan, you know you've left the Western world. It isn't as obvious or as intuitive in other locations. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's as difficult, if not more difficult, to figure out how to fit into a, uh, what seems like a more familiar culture. So um, I had the pleasure of managing a bunch of men, which was also an issue in Australia <laughs> in the year 2000 as a woman, um, because that was not normal. Um, and it took me, it, it wasn't normal, I'm not sure it's normal even today, um, uh, but it took me a while to kind of figure out the culture and how to work within the culture and um, by, by way of background, I mean most of you would probably know um, they have a penal colony history, right? So. Um, that, that runs really strong in their culture still today, and the way it exhibits itself is um, they don't like authority. And they don't um, applaud success unless you're an athlete or an actor um, of some sort. So um, those, those, those groups are exempted, but everybody else, if you get above kind of this equal layer of success, they have what they call the tall poppy syndrome which in the media means, you know, if the wind's blowing in a field of poppies, it's gonna chop off the tall ones. Um, so the media's role in Australia is to denigrate anyone that's successful in business. Um, and again, coming from America, that is really a 
odd way of thinking about the world, right? Because we celebrate success. Um, so, you know, those were things I had to kind of factor into my thinking. And after a while, um, I learned that the way to get things done was just to kind of exchange ideas and put out little tidbits and get people thinking about it. And then a few weeks later, they would come back and say, oh, Barb, I've got this great idea. Why don't we implement this? And they're, oh, wonderful. <laughs> um, then we'd go off on our merry way. But, um, you know, you certainly would never start a conversation um, in an instructional manner as in, you know, I want you to do X by Y, um, because that, that just was never going to work in that culture. Good. Before we go on, I just want to do a little check. Uh, are you guys in the back hearing OK? Yeah. OK, great. Thanks. OK, I'll go ahead and start. And notice that I moved that without knocking over that water. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to take a, a slightly different angle on the subject and talk about a relationship that principal has um, in totality with another organization. And I think in many respects it's challenging. Um, and that is we have a very successful joint venture with a state-owned uh, bank in China. And I would say that that relationship, even though it's successful, presents a number of challenges to us, both from a cultural standpoint and the differences from of just the, the way that um, our joint venture partner and <coughs> principal approaches a problem, how we deal with the problem, but also just the simple language barriers. And I'll tell you, I have to tell you a really funny story about the language barriers. So there's only about four people within Principal International that speak Mandarin. And so if you're, and I'm not one of them, by the way. <laughs> I wish I were. I have to like grab Hannah. Um, but within Principal International, there's not a lot of us. And so I was visiting um, our joint venture, and I was talking away, and uh, another person was translating for me. And I said, you know, I really, I, I turned to the translator and I said, I really hope that you're not translating something for me that would be culturally insensitive. And she looked at me and she smiled and she said, oh, you needn't worry. And the way she said that makes me think, <laughs> did anything that I say get translated? <laughs> or did she, I mean, was she talking about something completely different than what I wanted to talk about? Did any of the key messages that I wanted to talk about get through? And you know what? I'm not sure, I'm, not, I'm really not certain. I wonder how much of a filter that is. But, in addition to the language issues, there's also a number of cultural issues that make it, I think, particularly interesting and challenging to work with that, that um, group. Um, one of them is the way that they view hierarchies and how quickly you can offend somebody by reaching across or up or down. It really doesn't matter. There's a way to get, there's a way to work and it's up over down, <laughs> you know, or certainly you just don't go directly to the source of, of information without being very respectful of the hierarchy. And the other thing that I think we, we've noticed um, is that the, there's a very polite, save your face, save face mentality that you have to be very respectful of. And as Barb was saying in Australia, there's no such thing as saying, look, this is what needs to be done. Here's when it needs to be done by. This is what I'm going to do. You're going to do that, right? <laughs> and walk out only to find out your translator didn't say any of that. <laughs> so anyway, it's a challenge. Um, a, a fun challenge, a good challenge. Again, it's a successful business, but um, it, at many, many different layers. Um, it's an interesting, cultural, business-oriented um, situation that we face. All right, I guess I'll go next. Uh, so far, we've had stereotypes, gender and social norms, language issues, and I worked as a conference interpreter, so I can tell you it's not always exactly what the person <laughs> says. Um, I'm going to add to the challenges time as a uh, there is the superficial when people actually come to meetings, regardless of what time you set the meeting. Uh, my greatest challenge, and I, I was telling the panelists earlier, I'm going to leave out the clients that used to call me intoxicated for the moment. Um, and as I think about cross-cultural barriers, I worked on a project. Uh, we had won a tender from the Asian and Islamic development banks to equip community colleges in Yemen. 
and things don't move very quickly in Yemen. And when you do a tender for a development bank, you get a document that looks like a phone book. And the Yemeni government had already built the buildings, and the phone book lists every single thing they want in that community college. And you spend time and put together a bid, and I think 10 companies bid, and we won, uh, and you have to send them exactly what is in that catalog. Uh, and so, for example, the catalog said they wanted Dell Computer Model A with software Model A. All right, so we bid Model A. And it took them 10 months to decide what they wanted in the community colleges, at which point Computer A and Software are obsolete, and we now have Computer B and Software B. And, the Yemeni government, and they're cheaper. And the Yemeni government says to me, you may not send us Computer B and Software B, uh, because that's not what's in the tender. It's not what you offered, and the bank will not pay you. And we said, well, we can't get A. We only have B. And it's going to cost you less money. And they said, if it costs less money, clearly you are cheating us. <laughs> or your first bid was cheating us, and you're trying to charge us too much money. And so you talk for a couple months, and uh, <laughs> the Yemeni government then says, well, please submit a modification of your bid to show Computer B and Software B, and we will consider it in the Ministry of Education. So we do the whole thing, we send it to the ministry, uh, they wait six months, they send us a letter saying we are pleased to inform you that Computer B and Software B are acceptable to fulfill your tender, at which point we call Dell and they say we no longer have Computer B, we are now on Computer C. Uh, so these issues, when we think about time, which is a fascinating thing to talk about overseas, there are issues that I know we've all experienced of when people show up, but also notions of what is an acceptable time frame to do things in, the, the factor of urgency, uh, and the ability and flexibility to deal with change over time is also a challenge that complicates international business. At the risk of uh, leaning across the table and actually knocking over water for real, I'm gonna pull it back here. So, um, my name is Matthew and I, I teach here at Drake and I just, again, want to kind of reiterate what everybody else has said. Thank you for being here, first of all. Um, I like to introduce myself by saying I'm a recovering physicist. So my first degree was, was in physics and math and my first tour of duty outside of, of undergraduate was uh, programming cell phones. So I'm, I'm not tweeting, I'm not texting, I'm actually taking notes on this and that's kind of um, first, I guess, uh, an apology. When you ask kind of what the first challenge is with doing business across cultures, the first thing that, that comes to my mind is doing business across cultures isn't necessarily doing business across national cultures. Um, my first, like I said, my first job out of undergrad was um, as a software developer programming cell phones in London, and our development floor looked like a meeting of the United Nations. Um, we had, you know, everybody from South Asia, East Asia, English, Swedish, Finnish, U.S., South American, South African. Um, my boss was um, Dutch, his boss was French, his boss was uh, South African, um, who was a woman. So there was a lot of different cultures within this melting pot that was a, a software development firm. And so I guess when I think about my biggest challenge, it was not only connecting people across borders that were kind of co-located, um, but also getting creatives um, to talk to developers, to talk to management in a shared language. Um, they were each trained with a very unique skill set and a very unique perspective. Um, and those are cultures as well. And, and so when we talk about developing a global mindset, um, it's not only reaching across international and, 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 and national boundaries, but it's also recognizing the, the opportunities that we have to reach across cultures right where we are. Um, and so, again, you know, the, the imprint that that left on me um, was that, you know, sometimes we need to, to build up our skill set uh, for reaching across cultures, even where we sit right now. So, that's it. Great. Thank you, everyone. So we've already begun to, to do this in, in, in practice, but um, I, I want to give us some, an opportunity to reflect on, on lessons that these and other kinds of experiences have taught us. So uh, what are the keys to success in, in working across cultures? I think, I think one of the keys is that Regardless of who you're dealing with, which culture, 
um, the what background a person has. I think it's your mindset as you go into it. And I think if you follow, it's been my experience, that if you follow a few basic premises, a few basic rules, you may step in it, you may make a fool of yourself, but people will forgive you. <laughs> and the first one is to assume good intent. Um, just assume good intent, have the positive attitude that if something, if an interaction or um, an encounter doesn't go quite as you thought it might, you're, you seem to be getting either all smile with no, con with no content or, or the vice versa, no smiles and almost a, a shove away, to, to assume that they're not trying to shut you out, that they're not trying to um, disregard you. And so I think that's the first thing. Um, I think the second thing is being comfortable being uncomfortable. Because usually when you're in situations and you're running up against um, a, a cultural barrier, a difference, something that you're not quite sure what to do with, um, it's, it's okay that you're uncomfortable. That's just a piece of it. And in order to be successful in going across cultures, you have to be very okay in your own skin with whatever happens. So I think that's, that's a lesson and, a, and something that I think is, is very effective. Um, and then beyond that, try your best just to find the common ground. Find your best to, to find a similarity as well as a difference that, that maybe you can celebrate. And um, always eat the food. Always. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it down the hatch. It's a good, it's a good strategy. It really is. It really is. <laughs> I do have a, a couple of lessons that I have learned and I even took notes. Um, so be, because of my experience in Japan, um, it was very apparent to me that I needed to do my homework. I needed to understand more of the other cultures before making assumptions. So I, I took that very seriously and I learned it Japanese. It's conversational Japanese, but I understood that language barriers can promote misunderstanding. They don't solve all the misunderstandings, but they can promote that understanding or, or at least establish what Renee mentioned, uh, the intention. When you start taking steps to understand the other cultures, the language, people understand the signal. It's a positive one. Uh, so I'm not telling you to become fluent in every language you, you might think about, but if you're serious about living abroad, put some effort into it. I also think that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, when my Japanese colleagues would not say hello in the hallway, when my Japanese colleagues would just sit with Japanese uh, colleagues in the cafeteria and, and truly ignore all the Brazilians, I, I took it personally. Now I give people the benefit of the doubt. Uh, in what I do, I take it upon myself to engage them. I walk up, I offer, uh, uh, an invitation or a treat or a, an adventure into my own culture. So it's me taking the first step. I was very passive then. Now I think I am a bit more active in engaging people. Uh, and then uh, recognizing that there are stereotypes. Stereotypes will always, always be a part of our culture no matter which culture we're a part of. Um, understanding that stereotypes perhaps even have a little bit of truth in them but you have to recognize and acknowledge the cultural context and then engage the individual to learn from the individual what fits, what doesn't fit. So you really truly have to take that into account. Cultural context I think is to me one of the most important uh, successful tips that I can give you today. And then generally speaking, be curious, ask questions. I, when my Japanese colleagues would ask me um, in, in a dismissive way, uh, do you have uh, buildings in Sao Paulo? <laughs> and I would take offense. I, I, I didn't reject the question, I rejected the way it was asked. So be curious, ask questions in a respectful manner. Um, so the assumption was that everyone was walking around Sao Paulo naked, um, and that truly offended me. Uh, when many of you have been to Sao Paulo, you know naked is optional. 
So, <laughs> make sure you ask questions in a respectful manner. Again, I'm, I'm joking, but... <laughs> Wouldn't you say it's more Rio than something yeah. else? <laughs> yeah. So I'll stop here. <laughs> I think I'll add two things to the list, which is already very good. Um, one is an awareness of what you take for granted. Uh, and realizing that doing things differently doesn't necessarily mean doing things better. Uh, and that just because you get somewhere and the way they manage or the way they approach things isn't the same way you would do it naturally does not mean it's going to be more or less effective. And a very, I, I guess, uh, example recently, Matthew and I led a J term to Mexico and uh, we were traveling all over in a coach bus and one of the students who was sitting up front realized that pretty much at all times in Guadalajara there were three traffic lanes but five cars abreast. And they sort of watched for a day or two, and then one of them said to me, are there traffic laws here? And are there lanes? And the stop seems like a suggestion. And I said, okay, yes, all of that is true as you watch traffic move around uh, the city of five million in Mexico. Uh, how many traffic accidents have you seen? And the student stopped and she said, none. We didn't see a car accident the entire 15 days we were in Mexico, despite what from our view seemed like a very chaotic and unorganized and unsafe way to manage your transit. It works for them and they get from A to B safely. And so realizing that different is not always worse per se. Um, and that will, get, I think, take you a long way, especially when you first arrive places and start doing business. So one other thing, I guess I'd throw in the mix is just the power of observation. Um, you know, I grew up in a generation without cell phones, um, and we talked, how old fashioned. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, I benefit from that today because um, I, I know how to, in a polite manner, ask a question. I know how to, in a, in a not so polite manner, ask a question as well, which sometimes I have to do as well. Um, and that's fine, but it, it's amazing just through observing what's going on in another culture, how much you can learn, and then you can target your questions more appropriately. Um, but oftentimes people don't actually bother to kind of pay attention and observe what's going on. The only thing that I might add is I think doing your homework is absolutely the first step. Um, and we can do our homework here. The good professor is making sure that we're all doing our homework. Um, and then I think we are humans, and we, we need to recognize our um, psychological, emotional, physiological predispositions. Stereotyping is among them, right? We are, we are groupists. We, we tend to, to collect ourselves into groups. Um, if we do move into another culture, we need to realize that we're going to be, you know, going through a full range of emotions and experiences. Um, and so I think doing your homework allows you to mitigate the effects of some of those, um, especially if you're kind of new to the cross-cultural interactions. Um, and then finding ways and making opportunities to take that awareness, to take that you know, homework and putting it into practice to develop muscle memory. Um, this is not an experience where you can read a book and, and, and get to a place where you're going to be proficient. Um, it's something that, that needs to be enacted. Um, I am a long-suffering Chicago Bears fan, and I will say that very proudly. Um, and I, I make the analogy to, you know, middle linebacker Brian Urlacher, God rest his soul. Um, and, you know, he could read the entire defense manual for the Chicago Bears over and over and over and over and over and over again. Um, but until he learns to internalize that information and play by gut and instinct and take all that information and, and put it into muscle memory, it's very clunky and it's, you're, you're going to fail in many ways. So looking for opportunities to put an awareness into practice that will then allow you to develop that, that muscle memory and hopefully the global mindset. So um, I think that's critical. So many great ideas. Uh, Matt, can I get your notes afterwards? Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, in today's business world, we often hear that, that it's important to develop a global mindset or a global skill set. But how do we go about achieving these things? So let's address this at different levels. That, uh, what can individuals do for themselves? What can educational institutions like Drake uh, help our students do? And what can businesses do for, for their employees? And we have uh, uh, three different institutions represented here. So, you know, what are you, what are you guys doing? Or us doing? Should we let Drake start? Drake's gonna start. Drake start? All right. Uh, I guess Drake will start. Um, so I think one th one reflection uh, I would make is that as as I'm listening to my colleagues speak on the panel, uh, a lot of what we're giving you is a distillation of many years of experience. Um, and like Matthew said, you can't really develop this just from reading a book. Certainly, a book gets you started. Uh, if you've taken my class or Mitchell's class, you know you're reading cases, you're seeing examples of what other people have experienced. Um, but if you really want to develop these skills, you have to go out and suffer. By which I mean you have to leave the country, you have to say things that people look at you funny, or in my case, in Brazil, burst out, the entire bakery burst out laughing like on the floor because what I said was so wrong. Um, and so, in some ways, you just, the part of the building is actually the doing, that you have to go out, you can be equipped, you can take all the advice we've just given you, but in some ways you have to do. Uh, Drake is trying to make it easy and easier for students to do uh, these sorts of things. Um, and if you want more information, come see me, because I'm like the study abroad evangelist and half of international programs is here tonight. So, um, what else? Well, uh, let me uh, interject, interject that, uh, on your point that uh, I recall a time in China when I was trying to tell a taxi driver that I'm an American, and I managed to tell him instead that I'm a traitor to my country. <laughs> he said, welcome. <laughs> I guess, um, the, the studying abroad is absolutely critical. I think Drake has pledged to, to double our study abroad numbers, and, and that's something that we take very, very seriously. Um, we realize, with the leadership of, of DuPont Pioneer, of the principal, that this community is, is really, really primed um, for this leap into the world in a meaningful way. We've been there for a very, very long time, and sometimes I don't think we give ourselves the appropriate credit um, for being worldly. Um, one of my uh, good friends in, in the principal called it, uh, we need to develop a, a Midwest swagger. Um, the idea that, that we do have what it takes and we do have the, the, the ethics and the, the mindset and the hard work ethic to, to succeed in the world. And I'm, that's something I think this event is a wonderful, wonderful representation of that we're, we're celebrating this um, in, in the heartland. Really, um, and so I guess what are we doing to, to prepare? Um, yes, we need to, to send more folks abroad. Yes, we need to welcome more people here. Yes, we need to advocate to our, our legislators for policies that we believe in. Um, and and yes, we need also to recognize what we are doing well. And and I think um, not be self congratulatory or resting on our laurels, but recognize absolutely uh, Des Moines is a world-class city, um, and I'm not gonna apologize that for, for one bit. I'm gonna sell Des Moines, um, I'm gonna sell the businesses that are in Des Moines, and we'd be very, very, very proud of what we're able to deliver here. I'll throw in one thing um, to think about for the students in the room. Um, you have a great opportunity because there are now a lot of international students at Drake, and you do have the exchange programs where you can study abroad um, but you know a university environment is a safe environment and you can make a lot of mistakes in that safe environment that are much more challenging if you make them in a business environment um, and I I was blessed um, in graduate school to have a roommate from Taipei um, which was a huge eye-opener for me 
Um, you know, she would, she, week one, she started quizzing me after her friends would leave the room, were they Taiwanese or were they Chinese? And she expected me to know. And by week two, amazingly, I, I got it figured out <laughs> with, some, with some tips from her. But, you know, it's amazing what you can learn and how quickly you can learn from someone who wants to be a teacher. Um, and again, if you're willing, but I would just encourage you, you're in such a safe environment here, and for heaven's sakes, take, take advantage of that because you don't always have that privilege. Um, and you are privileged. So, um, you know, go in with that mindset and learn from each other. It's, it's fantastic learning. Um, so I'm gonna suck up now because we have one of our senior HR folks here this evening. Um, but I think one of the better things Principal did in recent years was as part of our performance evaluation process, we not only have goals every year, but we, we have competencies, and we're evaluated against a core group of competencies, and everybody in the whole firm is evaluated against those. Now, we've had the competencies concept for a long time, but they really globalized the competencies a few years ago. So when you read them out today, you know, they express um, even at the successful level, an expectation of a global mindset. Um, so setting the bar there was a big move for a Des Moines, Iowa-based company, right? Um, but it was great recognition of where we're going, um, the type of staff we need to be developing, and the expectations that we need to be clearly communicating to our, to our troops. And I, I think that was a huge move and very important. I think when I, I think sometimes we struggle to really define what is a global mindset and what does it mean to 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 be able to take advantage of a global mindset. And and I actually ran across what I think is a really interesting framework for thinking about global mindset. And it's and it really has three facets. One is the intellectual, where you at a very baseline, you need to understand as much as you can about the government, about the economy, about their culture, about their history. So there's, a, there's an intellectual element. Then there's the psychological element of diversity and of, of global mindset. And that's a keen interest and a, and a sincere willingness to understand the differences to under, and to be um, interested in the diverse diversity and know how it interacts with each other. We interact with one another. And the last piece is the social. And that, that is our ability to cut across cultures and to interact in a productive and in a, in a, uh, a beneficial way. I think the best groups, whether it be at principal, whether it be at Drake, whether it be at, you know, on a personal level, are those that somehow touch on all three of those that somehow allow you to get a better, uh, a deeper understanding intellectually of a culture or of a people, to, under, to, to challenge your own thinking, your own psychological framework about that person, that culture, and allows you to, to figure out ways to interact with that person or that, that group in a, in a more productive way. And I think what we're ultimately trying to get to, and, and this is tough, really tough, but I think what we're ultimately trying to get to is to gain, to, is to start to see patterns, is to look across cultures, different environments, different people, and begin to find patterns and best practices and good ideas that you can take back and use in your university, in your personal situation, for your company, whatever. I think that's the pinnacle. And I think we're all at various stages trying to get there. And I'll add a couple of comments. I completely agree with, with what was uh, shared with you today. And I remember um, when I was um, in Japan after, um, after I moved from Brazil, thinking I'm a Brazilian, and then I moved to Iowa about um, 15 years ago, and then I became a Latina, and I didn't know how that really fit with who I was and my background, and, and I had to redefine who I was in a completely different context. 
So the global mindset um, for me also is a little bit uh, ambiguous. I, I don't quite know what that is. The way I define it for myself is how do you effectively work with people from different backgrounds and get the job done and get high marks, competitive? How do you do that? It doesn't really matter where they're from. It just matters that you have to collaborate and get the job done. So for, for the um, individuals at Pioneer, where I currently work as a diversity consultant, there is a lot of training around unconscious bias. Um, what is the self-awareness? If the individual doesn't have an open attitude and doesn't have self-awareness about unconscious bias, it will always make some of those mistakes or overlook some of your colleagues and opportunities to learn from them. So what kind of trainings do we offer? What kind of tools do we have so individuals can learn? But I remember as a student at Drake University, being in the classroom and being very quiet. I was very uh, nervous about my accent, which I still have. I was very nervous about reading out loud, so I was a very quiet student. And for those of you who know me, you know I'm not a quiet person. <laughs> so it took a lot of time for me to build my confidence and, and find again who I was so I could demonstrate my abilities in the US. So for a lot of us that are interacting with people from different backgrounds, professors, if you are used to outspoken students, if you're used to certain set, uh, skill sets in the classroom or in the work environment, and you think that those skill sets equal great performance, you're missing out on all the other students that don't display those skill sets. So the students that are quiet, those in the room that are taking notes and have good grades, you have professors who should create an environment that they too can shine, they too can participate. How do you create an environment that is inclusive of all of you in the room, not only those that put their hand up right away? So I learned that companies are doing that. They're evaluating their, their processes, how they are thinking of people as great performers, so they can find those biases. I think professors should also and have an opportunity to do that in their own classrooms and put their own rules in place. That's the fun part. Um, I, I also, students, uh, I think taking ownership for your own learning and development in this space can start today and can start tomorrow. When you choose the, the peers that you're going to work with and those uh, projects that take hours, why not put a really diverse team together? Why not seek different perspectives and find out how those problems are solved in different parts of the world? Many times I wasn't chosen to be part of those teams and I found my own team. Uh, and I learned so much from those students. But thank goodness they were open to have me. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, I would have just been doing my own thing, which, which I knew and I learned early on that it was not to my benefit. I have a brother who is going to Iowa State University, and the first advice I gave to him is study with other people. Make sure that you're part of a team. Don't ever spend any minute studying by yourself because of the nuances of the language. You're missing the opportunity to read between the lines and understand the, the, the cultural context that it will take you years to understand. So you have to have a, a coalition of friends and peers that will catch things that you can't catch on your own. And we all have blind spots, so make sure that you, you have a, a, a group of people in place that will help you out. And I'll stop here. For me, uh, it was easy to spot that Claudia was an excellent student. <laughs> <laughs> but it really took a, a nurturing environment for me to find a place in, at Drake University. And it wasn't only Professor Skidmore, it was the staff and individuals that knew how to pull me in and get the best out of it. So I, I had a great experience at Drake because of that. Else on this point. So I'm going to uh, uh, pull an audible here, and uh, I'm looking at, at the time. What, what, one thing we've learned from, from the uh, past panels is that 
um, often the, some of the, the best parts and the most exciting comes when we open up to the audience. So I think I'm going to skip ahead uh, uh, to our last question, and then I'll hold and reserve if, if an opportunity arises. It looks like you know we can benefit from going back. We will, we'll, but um, and this is really, frankly, a, a question I'm, I'm very curious to hear the answer because um, I sometimes I sometimes wonder about this, and that is: Are culturally skilled and adept employees? valued and rewarded in the business workplace? You know, if so, how, and if not, why not? Um, one of the reasons that I, I, I preface by saying I was, you know, I, I was so curious about how you'll answer this is that sometimes we bring uh, top executives, CEOs on campus, and they reiterate the importance of these kinds of skill sets. and and uh, for the soft skills and liberal arts backgrounds and breadth and, and they really say we want thinkers you know and, and creative people build connections but what we also hear is that HR directors sometimes are looking to fill specific you know very specific skills sets when they're hiring in practice um, and may not pay as much attention to these broader questions so I, I put that to you, and, and I'm curious to hear the response. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, they, they kind of have to do it all, right? So, um, you know, just because someone's multicultural and maybe lived and worked abroad, um, that that's going to get them um, some credit. <laughs> we'll speak in a university term here. Uh, but um, you know they need more in the package than that sure. so um, it is a factor and again increasingly as you look just even at basic competencies that we're expecting of our employee base um, it is more and more about the expectation that um, you're going to have that either walking in the door or you're going to develop it pretty rapidly um, through exposure um, that you can gain when you're working in a big global organization. So, you know, we have employee resource groups. Um, we have a lot of opportunities. I mean, I, I'd be taxed to find very many people in the asset management part of the business that don't um, have some interaction with people in our offshore locations already. Um, it's become pretty routine. Um, so again, the, their ability to handle that, and that's in the competencies. You know, can you work effectively with people in multiple locations? Um, so those those are kind of almost baseline um, ingredients that you have to possess today. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And and to your point, Barb, you may be hired in with a technical skill set, and and you in in our in our company, a technical skill sets are required across the board. Um, but if you can't work across cultures, you will not last long. I don't think you will. You're not. You're certainly not going anywhere. <laughs> so you may as well leave. <laughs> that was stated a little abruptly. <laughs> but I think it's true. I think it ultimately. There's not a real big spot for people who, who can't work with other people, who can't cut across cultures. It's not a very, very big, meaningful role in our company for them. And uh, at DuPont Pioneer, and, and DuPont more broadly speaking, um, I think that you do have to have the, the technical skill sets for sure. With that said, I think there is room to recognize and groom people to become what they want to become, but if there's an opportunity to, to lead a region or lead a business unit and there's potential in that individual, I think the company is really focused in making that individual uh, achieve those goals. If that individual already have a global mindset or already showcases this effectiveness in meeting and, and working with people from different backgrounds, it's easier. If the person doesn't have that ability, then it takes a little bit more time to teach those skill sets, which, which can be teachable. Um, but I, I think those individuals, 
demonstrate credibility, they demonstrate leadership. Uh, there is a concept of inclusive leadership. Um, I don't know if you have heard about this concept. But this concept is about um, be bringing people in, bringing the best out of each one of your team members and, and having a really effective team in, in, that drive results, drive performance. And I think leadership recognizes that. They don't know it's inclusive leadership that's driving those results, but they recognize when there is a rock star that's performing very well on their teams. Uh, there is one example um, at DuPont Pioneer that I wanted to highlight. Um, maybe some of you know Bill Niebuhr, who is the vice president of uh, the, our operations in northern China. Bill Niebuhr is a scientist and uh, he worked uh, abroad for many years in France, Belgium, Italy, and came back to Johnston leading the research organization until when this next assignment uh, was proposed to him and he was sent to China, not knowing how to speak Chinese, not knowing much about the culture. Uh, the company provided some resources, of course, uh, as, a, as an assignment like that. There are resources available. But Bill already had a relationship with the Asian Employee Resource Group. He was the sponsor of that Employee Resource Group. And what he did once he moved to China, he kept those relationships and he made it even stronger. So what he was able to create was a cross-cultural network uh, for those that are coming from Johnston to China and from China to Johnston, that employee resource group served as a, um, a group of individuals that he could count on to take those visitors shopping or uh, interpretation services or whatever that might be. Bill understood the value of those relationships and never let go. Every time Bill Niebuhr comes to Johnston, he has the commitment with the employee resource group to give that group and all of their members, and it's open to all employees, a business update about what's happening in China. And China is a huge market for DuPont Pioneer. It's the, the second largest market for us right now. There is a lot at stake, and he takes the time, and he does that every time. So for me, that demonstrates the commitment to diversity and inclusion, that commitment to the global mindset, but also relationship building. And, and I think that's, a, to me, a very valid example because it, it demonstrates that uh, you can't make someone want to do that. I'm going to have to uh, just take a moment and you know, reflect um, what Claudia says. If we talk about inclusive leaders, it's the, the fact that we're sitting in this room doesn't escape me. We have a, a large banner over there about inclusive leadership. Right? Uh, if you look over here, we have a large banner about being a global professional. Um, and right behind us, you have a, a CBPA promise statement. Um, the CBPA prepares our learners to succeed as leaders and global citizens by bringing the world into the classroom and the classroom into the world. Um, you know, these are the, the promises that we try to make to, to our students. Um, so in answer to the question, are culturally skilled employees valued in the workplace? I think we've seen with our partners that, that yes, they are. Um, I would absolutely agree with, with everything that, that's been said, but um, I would like to, to also mention uh, in a conversation with Jim McCoggan, who's usually on this side of the, uh, the, the panel, um, one time he mentioned that one of the skills that he looks for in, in hiring and, and promoting is for somebody to, to keep their head up, to kind of do an external scan of the environment. Um, and that's one of the most valuable skills that I think goes right hand in hand with being globally minded. Um, we, we say the IB degree, the international business degree, probably isn't the best choice for a first degree uh, you're not going to get hired right out of school and invested in, you know, to, you know, average expatriate assignment costs somewhere around a million dollars. That's not what a, a newly minted graduate is going to, to go into. So you're going to be hired based on your functional skills. But the IB degree gives you that, that, that kind of head up, that, that scanning mentality, 
being globally aware, and it will earn you your second job, your third job, or your first or second promotion. Um, so are they valued right out of the gate for my undergraduate students? Yes, but, but definitely going forward in your career, I think it's, it's even more valuable. As a caveat, I got my first two jobs because of cultural skills and nothing to do with technical <laughs> skills. But I was in international sales and marketing, and the company said, we can teach you about our products faster than we can teach a sales guy, another person French. And so we'll put you through six months, and you're off to Quebec, and you're going to Paris. Yeah. Um, so for certain positions, the cultural skills will get you in the door. And that's, yeah. But then you still have to, be, uh, you have to hustle and make sure you can learn the rest of it soon thereafter. And this, this, so from a, this from a show off that speaks at least five languages. Uh, so, seven, okay. Last, uh, a few weeks ago it was five, so it's up to seven now. Just now, just now. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so we're going to uh, uh, give you a chance to ask some questions. What I'd like to ask you to do is when you're called on, please stand up. Please tell us your name. Speak loudly enough so everyone in the room can hear. And please remember that you're asking a question rather than giving a lecture. <laughs> so, um, who would like to, to begin tonight? Phil. Phil. I'm Phil Leno. Uh, I just want to add a couple comments on the. Uh, mentioned that about stereotypes. Sometimes there's truth in stereotypes. I was working as a co-director of an agribusiness center 800 miles south of Moscow, and my co-director was working for the state government, the Krai government, and he had this great big Russian desk with the telephones all over, and was a very rigid man. And I needed one of the types of telephones to get up to Moscow. This was as the internet began. <coughs> I had to get up to the Sprint node up in Moscow, and he wasn't going to. He says, "We'll see about it." But I went and addressed a friend of mine in the building, a Russian friend, who got it installed kind of behind his back. Of course, he knew that. But I had more respect for me because I did that, because that's the way a Russian would have done it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other thing is, I, I worked in Belize, Central America, in Russia, Kenya, Finland, uh, and you get in situations, but you meet people, and the people are embarrassingly gracious. Uh, sometimes you're holding in your back pocket more money than they make in a year, and they'll take you in and feed you, and that's always something to be aware of, you to be respectful of. Yeah, good. Yeah, David. Uh, Jim McCarthy. Um I was fascinated by Claudia's comments on Japan, which is not only one of my favorite cultures, but is also often described as the graveyard of careers. I've heard it described that way quite frequently. And actually, we at Principal had, 15 to 10 years ago, an extremely unsuccessful business in Japan that we eventually had the guts to cut. In the last five years, we built a very successful one which uh, actually is kind of an interesting change. And I think a lot of the difference is this global mindset, this listening. Um, one of the reasons I think that Japan is a graveyard for careers is you go into a meeting in Japan, you talk to people, you come to a sort of discussion, they nod their heads and say, hi, hi, domo arigato. And at the end of that, you think, hey, I've got an agreement, we know what we're doing. But they didn't mean we know what we're doing. They meant, yes, I hear you. I'm going to think about it. And so many people come out of those meetings not interpreting correctly what they've heard. And it's not just about language. I could go on about language. But I think that interpreting and listening is so important. And I'd be interested from the panel to hear ways they've improved their listening and contextual skills. Because I think that's what really differentiates a global mindset. I will offer some comments, um, but again, far from being the right answer or the right um, tip, 
but I have um, had a very recent experience in which I was in the middle of the miscommunication. <laughs> I have a set of parents from Brazil who actually lived in Japan for 20 years. They have 20 years of experience in watching movies without understanding what's being said. <laughs> and they love it. And they enjoy it. And they're pretty good at guessing the end of the movie or what's happening, but it's not... translation, I not understand. <laughs> so it was interesting to me to, to, to watch a movie with them in English, and they don't speak English. Um, and, and understand what they thought for sure was happening wasn't happening. So put that aside for a moment. Um, I have a set of in-laws who were born in, in the US. They only speak English. And the six of us, my husband and I, my parents and my in-laws just took a vacation together to Hawaii. And the two sets of parents were talking to each other. My husband and I were interpreting and uh, we could catch some of those nuances and some of those moments in which my mom was nodding and we were not done talking. Um, so she was ready to take action. I'm like, no, we're not done yet. Hold on. Um, so the communication went pretty well. Both of them are very relaxed. But I could tell that my mom, some video, <laughs> my mom more than anyone else and my mother-in-law, they were more eager to, to, to dive into action and, and, and make, take the next step into the conversation. So they were making assumptions about what was being said. Um, and I think it goes back to what you said, the patience and the listening skills. Um, it took me a long time to understand that, uh, that in, in the U.S., when you say something, the language is much more specific than in Japanese or in Portuguese. So understanding that in the English language helped me avoid some of the misunderstandings. Uh, in this case, it's really listening and verifying. Is that what you meant? Is that what you mean? Did I understand correctly? I learned to paraphrase, paraphrase a, a lot of the, the dialogues I have, um, and I think that helps just to confirm, are we on the same page? So you, for all of you, you'll catch me doing a lot of that just because I want to be sure. <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think that's very fair. Just checking for understanding is incredibly important um, because it, it's amazing. Um, despite the fact that I spend a lot of hours every day talking to people with non-American accents, um, you know, there's always a new one to, that gets served up to me, and, and now it's our CIO in Mexico. And he is, he's, I don't know whether he's French or Italian, but he's from Argentina, yeah, and, Argentina. and the Spanish people all say they can't understand him either, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why he grew up speaking in Argentina. Yeah, but it, it's just That's hard. Why Juan's it. really hard to understand. Um, but it was a good reminder, because I haven't dealt with somebody like that for a while, that again, you have to really think hard, you have to um, recap the conversation at times just to make sure you're really getting what they're intending and that you're not off base with them. Um, but maybe just as important, Jim, I'd say, is also how you speak to them. Yes. Um, so it's getting rid of um, weird things like seasons. So I, I don't refer to seasons any longer because I deal with people in both hemispheres all the time. And it's really easy when you're tired to forget that you're just saying spring to Brazilian and you know that it's not their spring, right? Um, so there are simple things that you learn after a while that you just cleanse your language of and even your football analogy about the beers, you know, wouldn't work. <laughs> Maybe it didn't even work for this whole room. <laughs> China and um, I happened to overhear a, a conversation um, the school I was associated with decided to start doing executive training and they brought in a, an American business consultant uh, and a group of mid-level Chinese executives and uh, the business consultant you know they spent the morning you know running through a Harvard Business School case study and uh, 
then they were kind of debriefing, you know, over coffee, and uh, he sort of solicited, you know, so how are things going? And, and the Chinese were very frustrated, and they were very confused, and uh, sort of let him know that they were not happy, and they, you know, with what had just happened. And uh, so, well, what's wrong? I said, well, you know, um, you, you come here, you you're the expert, and you have us read this case, and then you start asking us questions, <laughs> and then when we ask questions, you answer with more questions, <laughs> and you're the expert, and it, you know, obviously you must know the answer, but for some reason you're hiding it from us, and uh, if you would only tell us the answer, then if this situation arose, we wouldn't know what to do. And so there was a total miscommunication about the basic purpose and mode of analysis and what they were doing and how they were doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, so both sides, I think, uh, ought to set some ground rules and expectations before jumping into an exercise. Yeah. Um, sir. Uh, my name is Saeed. I have a question both for Principal and Tupac right here. How do you attract global minded and business savvy students? And do you have programs? How do you, what criteria do you have to like employ them? Thank you. Yeah, we have, um, I, I think, a couple of ways. First off, Principal, and I know Pioneer does this as well, has a number of intern programs, opportunities for internships. And that's an excellent way for an employer to get a feel for um, a potential employee and to see how they think, how they respond, how they, how they maneuver in the workplace. So clearly, that, and that's the best way to see firsthand not only what the, someone says they're going to do, but what they actually do in the workplace. But short of that, because not every job starts with an internship, um, it really starts with a good um, behavior-based set of interview questions where you're actively listening, you're questioning, you're trying to determine how, how a person thinks and how they do approach problem solving and personal interrelationships and global mindset. So I think a lot of it is just the basic blocking and tackling with employee selection. Yeah, similarly at DuPont Pioneer, we have behavioral based interview questions during the selection process. And as part of, of the set of questions that we ask of candidates for internships or otherwise, uh, we do have questions regarding inclusion. Uh, we do want to, to have an indication if the talent we have is in, an inclusive person. And uh, that process, I think, allows us to say, okay, this person has technical skills and a, a global mindset. So that's how we select uh, the, the talent we have. Yes. I, I want to thank Barbara for mentioning. Oh, hello. I'm Gretchen Becky from Puritary. And uh, I wanted to thank Barbara for mentioning the idea of rooming with an international student because um, we have over 300 international students at Drake, and it's a great laboratory, a great opportunity to meet people from over 40 different countries right here on campus. And so I think a lot of the things that you've been talking about tonight can actually be put into practice this week. Um, I want everybody to study abroad, but even until, even before then, they can start um, practicing these skills. Uh, my question is for, for both um, corporations represented, when you're talking about seeking people with a global mindset, are you looking for Americans with a global mindset, or is your hiring broader than that? Our hiring is way broader than that. <laughs> Yours is as well. So, um, you know, that's, in some ways, it's probably more challenging um, in certain other countries than it is in a city like London, where what our staff has 60, 70 people, and how many countries today, Chris? I mean, it's a little uh, UN. Yeah, something about 40, 42 maybe. Yeah. So, um, you know, you get to London and in the U.S., and, and we tend to be able to get to a lot of diversity. But, um, you know, my joke about our Japan team is our diversity is a guy named Jun Kim who happens to be from Korea. Um, and he's the, the single non-Japanese in the office, right? But um, they have diversity in another way. 
um, which is they have a lot of women. Um, which is highly, highly unusual. And that, that I credit um, Toshi Itagaki for, who heads the office. Um, he spent about 10 years here in the US. Um, he crosses the divide between Western thinking and Japanese thinking um, in a way that few people in Japan can do today. And he recognized um, when he came and joined us and we set up our office, um, that there was this just great untapped reservoir of skillful women um, that other, especially Japanese companies, were completely ignoring. So, you know, one of our bigger challenges, I think, in the organization is actually sourcing people in our foreign locations with a global mindset, more so even than here. I don't know, Jim, whether you have any other yeah, thoughts on that? It's, it's certainly true in, uh, in Japan. And uh, you know the Chinese actually many of the people don't really naturally have a global mindset, but they're at least willing to learn the ones that we we have. So it does vary a lot. But uh, London is really our melting pot. It's just got so many nationalities. But you know I was uh, I was in a meeting here in Des Moines for, with one of our equity clients, and I commented that the three people they were meeting I'm originally Scottish. Uh, there was a Turk and a Bulgarian. And I said, this is a typical group to meet from principal. <laughs> <laughs> Could I uh, just uh, follow up with a question? Uh, you, you brought gender to the conversation. And uh, one of the, the, the trends nationally in higher education is that females are much more likely to study abroad than male students. Um, and I'm wondering whether you notice any uh, greater openness to, to, you know, engaging other cultures among women as opposed to men, or is that not part of your experience? I, I, te I tend to be gender blind, I'm afraid, <laughs> so um, I don't, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I've got a great observation on that, but I find it fascinating that you have women signing up for your study abroad, yet women won't study finance. So probably my greatest disappointment is um, the lack of women entering business schools and studying fields like finance. Um, it's actually at a lower rate than it was when I was in university a long, long time ago now. And I find that really horrifying. Um, so that's, that's that's even more so than the global mindset, that's a bigger challenge for us in the US today, um, is finding young women coming into the business um, with the appropriate skill sets. Um, so that, that's, that's a challenge for you at Drake to help us with, right? And yet, yet, as you're a good example of our, within the asset management side yes. of principle, about half of the senior management are women. Pretty close. Yeah, we're we're a little we're a little unique that way. Thank yeah. you, Jim. <laughs> yeah. I know that to my role, boss. Yeah. You've been a great role model in that, and uh, I think part of it is about showing by example that it's possible. Yes. And I'll give you a very sort of quirky international example. Uh, one of the other very senior women in our organization. Um, I decided on a trip to Saudi Arabia that, up to among other things, use that trip for diversity and cultural reasons, because Saudi Arabia is about the toughest place in the world for a Western woman to do business. And I said to one of my colleagues, yeah, why don't you come? We'll see some clients and prospects in Saudi Arabia. And she came and had to dress up, everything covered, while out on the street, not in the office, but out on the street. But she wrote a blog about her experiences there, which was actually last year's most popular staff blog. But it was actually popular because it was demonstrating to the people who read it a good example of making a tough culture accessible. That was really what that was about. And I think, I think it's things like that that you can do to, to give that example and just show it is possible. We do a session for students called Women in Asset Management and we're pretty rigorous. I don't get to speak at it, but Barb does just to show them it is possible that people like them can be very successful in this business. And, and you do learn over time. Um, I, I mean, I learned really early in Japan, for example, I didn't travel with men. 
Um, so I would go to meetings and um, the, so this again, think 15 years ago, um, the, the language barrier is not so great there today as it was at that time, but 15 years ago I'd come in and be all men and I always said I, I had a tattoo on my forehead that said freak and it was in <laughs> screaming flashing neon um, when I was in Japan. Um, but they'd all, you know, they weren't, they weren't very happy about having a meeting with me, but they would. And then, um, you know, they'd never speak English to me. They'd always go through a translator. But if I'd ask them a question in English, they would immediately start speaking in Japanese to the young guy who was translating for us, right? So they knew exactly what I was saying, um, but they refused to speak to me. Um, and if I had a man with me, they would never say anything to me in the entire meeting, right? So there are just things you learn over time that you have to advance the ball in your own way and get through it. Um, and time, time changes a lot um, in all cultures. And it's amazing, um, you know, how rapidly um, norms are changing. But there are always exceptions like Saudi. Yeah, and yeah. even that is not a, not a total exception. No, actually. no. It, there is. The, the gender divide is actually getting less in business even though. Yes. Other questions? Gentlemen? Uh, Hi, my name is Sarah and I had a question for the group of people in So obviously principal promotes diversity and um, you know, you sponsor this event and everything. Don't you think it's a little strange that principal of the national group does not offer any kind of recent sponsorship for the national citizens? Um, for H-1B visas in particular, yeah, I can speak to that. Um, part of the issue that we have with H-1B visas is that it's literally a lottery or a luck of the draw if you're going to get one. And so the problem that we have, and, and I, I face this head on in trying to staff positions to work in Asia in particular, if we hire somebody full time and we assume that we're going to get an H-1B visa and we don't, then we're in the very uncomfortable, unfortunate position where we have to release that person. We are trying to figure out how to make that work. Um, and I'll tell you what we've done and it's not, it's not ideal. But in order to get around that, what we've done is we've hired the last two international students, the persons that were, were not from the United States, where we knew we couldn't get H-1B visas. We hired them with knowing that they had yet another year they could spend in the United States after they graduated. We hired them. We're sending them through as deep of, an, of a, um, of a program as we can within the principal to get them the technical skills that they need and then we are putting them in country and boy I tell you what if we could get our hands on H-1B visas and we could depend on it it would be a big thing a big thing for us I would celebrate I really would it's it's a big issue yeah. um, may I ask whether principal lobbies uh, in Congress to change the rules? I don't know that we have. I just don't know the answer to that. Probably not. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, unfortunately, you, you know, it's it's a very political situation, obviously, in the U.S. around visas. But um, I would say, you know, we have hired people um, and gone to, I've personally taken people through the, the immigration process while I've been at principal. Um, and it is a tough, tough, tough process um, and I think everybody just has to go into it with their eyes open um, I have had to literally overnight um, have candid conversations with people that you know they may be gone tomorrow and we're gonna try to help but there are limits to what we can do um, we have had to get very creative and send people to our London office um, again overnight um, because of what happens with the immigration services here so um, if People come in um, with really specialized skill sets. Um, it is easier, um, I'm not gonna say anything's easy in that process, but it is easier to petition for 
um, you know, permanent residency. Um, so I think in our more specialized asset management skill set categories, um, there are fewer candidates that meet all the criteria, so we have been able to get some of them through, including the Bulgarian that he just spoke about. Yeah. So. But London has, has actually been very useful to us. It's been people, amazingly good people to us. People have to get permits to work at the H1 visas here. Yep. Quite often we can get permits to work in the UK. That's right. And uh, we've done that with several people. But so after the financial crisis, still, London yeah. sent everybody home. Well, right. London has had its ups and downs. It's That's right. reasonably open right now. It's open right now. Yeah. But yeah, so it's, it's hard to reliably deal with this as a global company. Yes. Um, it, it's one of the toughest things we face because talent and talent development is so critical to us. And something that we hear over and over and over again is we are in this global war for talent um, here, abroad. Um, I would say Drake has been very vocal about that issue in particular, advocating for immigration reform, and along with the, the Greater Des Moines Partnership and other local institutions, and Patricia, if you'd like to speak on that as well. Um, they take that message very, very clearly. Um, in fact, in their annual visit to, to Washington, that's, I think, first on their agenda is, is immigration reform. I, I've said if it's you know up to me, and I'm probably gonna go on record for this, um, if it were up to me, we would be at the end of the graduation line, you know, welcoming talent uh, like yourself um, in, into this country. Um, we've collected stories from our international students um, that, that are heartbreaking. And I think we're putting together more and more and more um, documentation and, and just doing our part, I think, to address that issue. Because frankly, I want that global talent to stay here in this community. Full stop. Probably most global business people think that every American graduate degree should come, should come with a green card staple to it, but it's not going to happen. Because it's not going to Politics happen. are so entrenched. Yeah. But I've heard numerous people, Silicon Valley people as well as finance people, say exactly that. Yeah. Amen to that. Uh, the uh, woman in the back. Uh, good evening. My name is Shaima. I'm a former great grad um, in the A program. I have a question for the principal. Speaking of uh, the uh, Middle East and financial crisis, let's shift it to political crisis. Um, you have mentioned you have business in the Middle East. What is the size of this business and which countries it's located and what's the impact of budget political progress there? Yeah, so. Um, we have an office in Dubai for Principal Global Investors, and it is our newest offshore office. Um, so it's been up for three, three, years. three years now. Um, and we were literally doing a fly-in, fly-out strategy for several years before getting our license. And Jim, Jim and our um, former head of international sales were kind of swapping months, but one of them was on the ground literally every month, kind of building our presence, building our reputation, contact base. Then once we felt comfortable, we went ahead into Dubai. Um, Dubai is a great beachhead because of the licensing for a financial firm. Um, so it, you know, it's pretty easy, frankly, um, to do business, not just in the Middle East, but also across Africa um, from Dubai. Um, and it, it's, in, it's an interesting and rapidly growing financial center. Um, so it's going to be an important beachhead for us. Um, we're already beginning to talk about putting investment staff in that location. We haven't done it yet. It's just a sales location, um, but that will come. That will come in time. And you know, Dubai really hasn't been as impacted, um, certainly, by some of the turmoil. That doesn't mean it can't be, but um, today it's been pretty good. Now, the, the former financial center was Bahrain, um, and they've had a very different experience, obviously, in Bahrain. Um, so again, I think, if anything, it's probably solidified um, the status of Dubai as the international financial center. So uh, we're approaching the end of our time, but uh, to close, I'd just like to ask each, each of you to offer a, a very quick closing thought. And we'll start with Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> you can offer your thought in any language you prefer. <laughs> no, no, we'll, 
we'll, we'll do it in English so everyone understands. Um, I don't have a closing thought. I would say get out and do it. Get out, get out, go, see the world. Not um, right now, you can do the same. <laughs> well, apparently Barb will send you to London on the 10 o'clock out of Des Moines, but... Um, the, Whether you want to or not. <laughs> So the, the bottom of my syllabus every term uh, has a quote from St. Augustine that said the world that says the world is a book and those who do not travel read only one page and I would encourage you to aim for at least a chapter in your lifetime. Yes. Oh, no, so I <laughs> Man, I hate following you. <laughs> Take risks and eat everything. There we go, there we go. <laughs> no, so yeah, but, but there is something around taking be, not to be frightened to take the risk, not to be frightened to reach across and, and, and seek understanding. And know that, yeah, occasionally you're going to make a fool of yourself. Um, but more often than not, you run into wonderful people who are also very eager and anxious and assuming good <coughs> intent. Um, and you'll, you'll feel a lot richer as a result. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to remind people that um, Des Moines is a much more diverse place than you would expect. Um, a good friend of our family um, lost his mother recently, and he and his family immigrated after World War II and re were actually refugees in Germany, but they were originally from Latvia. I had no idea we have a Latvian society in Des Moines, but we do, and I learned after the funeral because we had the luncheon at the Latvian society. So there's all sorts of opportunities right here in Des Moines, Iowa, um, if you want to have different cultural experiences, and they're not even just all at Drake. Oh, how many international students do we have in the room? I just want to know. Uh, no, 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 no. Very good. Well, I was an international student uh, at Drake University, and even though I met my now husband back in Japan and we were dating, I didn't know if I was going to stay in the U.S. Um, after graduation. So I know how unsettling it can be to go through your studies for four years or more and not know what's going to happen. But here's my advice to you. One step at a time. Focus on doing the best you can today. Take good grades. Uh, continue to talk with your advisors. Carve your own brand, your spot at Drake University in this community. If you can't get a paid internship, get an unpaid internship. If you can't work right now, be creative. Talk to employers. Don't let employers <coughs> or advisors define your future. Take action. Um, I know Principal, DuPont, other companies have limitations. Unfortunately, those limitations are not because we want them to be that way. Um, we can talk a lot about that. Um, understand those limitations and be creative. Um, one book that I'd like to leave you with today, if you have the time to read for pleasure, it's uh, by Franz Johansson. It's uh, called The Medici Effect. It's talking about how different um, perspectives, different backgrounds cause intersections. And every time you have an intersection, it's a spark of innovation. Um, it, that will, I think, maybe inspire you to find a path forward um, if you don't know what's going to happen upon graduation. For those of you that don't have to worry about what's going to happen after graduation, make the best of it as well. I guess I would just conclude by first of all saying thank you for, for you for being here for the panelists. Um, at, at the risk of sounding way too cliche, I think you know thinking globally and acting locally just seeing your presence here is very, very encouraging for me. Um, not only from the students, but from the community members. Um, I think, at least at, at Drake College of Business, our goal is to have the best international business program in the world. Our goal is to train our students to be not only aware, um, but competent and, and confident when they go out into the world. And I would like to say that we've developed a, a good momentum in partnership with the community, with nonprofits, with um, regulatory agencies in the area. Um, so much so that I think um, just last month we were very, very excited to announce the largest single gift uh, in the history of the College of Business was given to support 
this very topic, um, doing business across cultures, seven million dollars um, that we can use to send our students abroad, to put them into immersive language learning opportunities, and ultimately put them into a global internship opportunity. Um, that's the type of momentum and leadership that I think I'm very, very excited about. So thank you um, for being here, and, and thank you for investing in, in this topic. And David, thanks to, the, to you and, and the, the Principal Financial Center, or excuse me, um, Principal Financial Group Center for Global Citizenship uh, for, for putting this on. Well, my last thought will be that uh, whether you, you make a career in business or, or any other field, that uh, a good reason to embrace global citizenship is that it's a fun and interesting way to live your life. Uh, thank all of you for coming. Thank the panelists. What a wonderful time. We'll see you next time.